as Deputy Director of the CBI, Henrietta leads the commercial team in developing and implementing the CBI's commercial business strategy. She is responsible for developing the group's membership proposition, leading the CBI's regional teams across the country, the organization's digital strategy, and creating new member services with a focus on supporting and enabling businesses to grow. She is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Marketing and holds non-executive positions, one of which is with Franklin Templeton Investments, who the college currently works with as an academic partner. Rebecca is a senior research fellow in the Department of Social Policy and Interventions and was appointed as Oxford's first advocate and pro-vice chancellor for equality and diversity in January 2015. The role provides leadership and coordination of all equality and diversity issues across the university in order to advance the university's commitment to building an inclusive culture for all its staff and students. She's a governing body fellow of Green Templeton College and became vice principal in 2018. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Rebecca and Henrietta. Thanks so much, Kerry. Um, welcome everybody. And thanks so much for joining us on a, a busy bit of the, uh, the Nicholas term. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to talk with Henrietta Jowett today, uh, not only because she's going to be talking about a topic which obviously, as you've just heard, is very um, important to, to me and close to the work I do, but because, like some of you, um, I was lucky enough to hear Henrietta when she was our guest speaker at the Foundation Dinner um, last year and absolutely enjoyed her presentation and um, were very lucky to be able to encourage her back today. So um, Henrietta, thank you. We know how busy you are and we appreciate you making time for this. Um, before we get into the sort of substantive discussion about um, EDI, uh, I wonder whether you just begin by perhaps telling us a little bit about you and your background. Um, I, think, uh, I think our audience would just enjoy hearing more about you. Thank you. Cool. Of course, um, and thanks very much, Rebecca and Kerry, for the introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, I'll start with uh, I'll start with when I was at Oxford. Um, so way back when, uh, for many of you, it will seem like the dark ages, I'm sure. Um, but dinosaurs roamed the streets of Jericho. They were found in Summertown and Ifew Road, and they hung out in the pubs and also the lecture halls of Oxford. Uh, they certainly played lacrosse and tennis in the university parks, and they punted on the Charwell. Um, and they read strange things called books in libraries. Um, so given the analogy, um, it may not be, uh, come as a complete surprise to hear that I read natural sciences um, at LMH and I specialized in zoology. Um, and micro anything has never really been my forte. So um, I didn't um, focus on uh, microbiology, for example, or genetics. I focused on animal behavior, physiology, entomology, and ecology. And one of my favorite tutors was Richard Dawkins. Um, who was absolutely fantastic. And whilst what I learned in his tutorials on behavior didn't lead to any great academic application, sorry about that, Richard. Um, it has, however, been a real sort of um, binding th um, sort of theme throughout my career in business. And it forms what I call a golden thread, very much around sort of observation, analysis, uh, thinking, application, and interest in, in all of the work that I do within, within businesses. Now, when I graduated, it did cross my mind to try and join BBC Bristol, um, where there was a certain Mr. Attenborough, who was um, beginning to gain fame from his sort of TV work on animals and conservation and all of those sorts of things. I thought that might be quite an interesting opportunity. But at 21, all my friends were heading to the dizzy heights of London and Bristol just sort of didn't really quite cut it. I didn't think that was the answer I was looking for. So like many graduates who, who leave, <clears throat> leave Oxford, um, I applied to um, the businesses that had their annual graduate management programs, uh, where you come in as a cohort and, and, um, and go through a sort of three to five year program. And I found myself at H.J. Hines, the food manufacturers, as the first female graduate they'd actually taken onto their UK scheme. So I began my career of firsts. I was that first female graduate. Um, I was also their first female area sales rep. Um, I was the first senior manager to actually have a baby. Um, I was the first non-fee earning female partner, um, first female on Exco, first female to be sent from my business onto the advanced management program at Templeton College as it was then, which Kerry mentioned. 
but firsts are not always that great. Um, and frankly, it can be a bit lonely out there. Um, and actually in my current role, it's the first time I've actually had a female boss, which is quite strange as well. Uh, she's terrific, absolutely love working for her, but it, it, when you reflect on it, it, it is a, a rather strange conundrum, isn't it? So I spent the first 18 years of my career in the food industry, as I said, with Heinz. I then worked for Nestle, looking after Kit Kat, and then United Biscuits. And actually that's where this sort of golden thread began to be useful. So instead of animal behavior, I was effectively studying human behavior. So how do different people live? How do they behave? What do they eat? And what do they need? And then how do we as a business help them with those needs and grow our business profitably as a result? And this took me all the way across the UK, it took me to Europe, and then really importantly, it took me to Asia, and in particular, China. And this is where that golden thread of behavior really did begin to matter. Listening, observing, analyzing, and understanding a very, very different culture and the associated behaviors. And that was absolutely critical to the renewed strategy and plans I put together to rescue that Chinese business. Because when I arrived, we had a plant mothballed in the north, we had one in the south that was operating at about 40% capacity. And all of our Western colleagues were standing around wondering why Chinese consumers didn't like biscuits that much. Well, the problem was, I don't think anyone had actually asked them, but actually really importantly, they hadn't watched and observed them. They hadn't looked at the ch potential Chinese consumers in all the different regions across this vast country with all sorts of different habits um, and ethnicities and ways of, of, um, of living their lives, and then worked out how best to satisfy those particular needs rather than just going, here's a bunch of biscuits, I'm assuming you're going to like them, please, please buy them. So that was really, that was a real sort of test of um, where my experience at Oxford was brought into a business and really helped shape that strategy. From there, um, I then moved into financial services. Um, and yes, client needs and behaviors were still incredibly important, especially when you're designing financial products, financial services. But because I wasn't working at the product level any longer, I was working at the group level. So at the sort of the, um, at the top of the organization, it was actually the whole organization I was focused on. And interestingly, it was how businesses as a whole behaved that actually became the more challenging question. Now, the reputation of anything, but in, in this context, business is actually a function of its repeat behaviors. If you take a duck, for example, everybody will say it will waddle. Why do you know it waddle? Because it always does. Behavior is a function of repeat, uh, reputation is a behavior, uh, function of repeat behaviors. So understanding what those are and how they shape what clients and customers and indeed the general public think of you is vital if you want to be successful. And the financial crash of 2007 and eight when I was working in financial services showed that those behaviors in financial services were not in some cases that great. And not only were they a major risk to the business itself, but they were a risk to the markets and to whole economies as well. So corporate behaviors and how a business behaves overall became the main area of my focus and within that risk management. And this then means that all aspects of your business become incredibly important. So who and how you recruit, how you develop your colleagues, What's it like to work there? How you make decisions? What products and services you choose to provide? Why? How do you do it? How you look after your customers and how you communicate both internally amongst colleagues and externally. And the whole culture of the organization drives the behaviors, which then delivers that reputation, which is in many circles, what many people call your brand. It's what you're known for. And it's a vital part of your risk management and of your company performance. So if you want to change that reputation, then the whole culture of the organization needs to change. And because all aspects of your business are impacted, it has to be a core part of your overall business strategy. And this is where diversity and inclusion comes in. Those businesses that have a real focus on DNI within their business strategy and great plans to deliver for their customers and their colleagues will be the businesses that are the most successful in the future. And this is because it impacts their behaviors so fundamentally and therefore their reputation and their brand. And that brings us very nicely into our discussion um, as to why having a diverse and inclusive workforce is so important for the future success of everybody's business. 
Thanks so much, Henrietta, for that absolutely fascinating uh, thumbnail sketch. And even though you uh, condensed, crammed a lot of information into a couple of minutes, several decades uh, of your experience, yeah. I think we got a sense of um, just uh, uh, the trajectory of your, your own professional development and your thinking. Um, I was struck by something you said, which was that being the first of something isn't always great and it can be actually quite a lonely place to be. And um, at Oxford, we're just celebrating the centenary of women students being formally admitted to the university uh, this October. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about what it must have been like for those women. I mean, a hundred years seems just uh, just around the corner and is is very recent, uh, especially in the context of 800 years of this institution's history. Um, do you have a sense of just how things have changed at Oxford even since, you know, the, the few decades since you first came here? Have things changed? Um, I hope so. Um, so uh, when I, and I know they have, when I first arrived, um, most women went into single sex colleges and there were about five of them, something like that. And I think there were two or three colleges that all mix. I think St. Pat's and Hartford and maybe one other, I can't remember. Um, and so the ratio of male to female was five to one. Um, so quite significantly different. Um, and I suppose the second thing is I read sciences, which um, is unusual for women anyway. So had I been reading English or history, it might've been different. Um, but, you know, of the sort of 80, 80 or so people that went on to do the sort of zoology bit of natural sciences, I think there were only two or three of us that were women. Um, so, again, um, laboratories full of blokes. Um, not that that's bad, but it was just interesting that we were very much in the minority. And then I think the other thing that's very different um, for, um, for universities as a whole, actually, but also definitely has an impact on, um, on um, Oxford, is it's more competitive. Because when I was, went to university, probably only about seven, between seven and 10% of people actually went to university. Everybody else went straight into the workplace or went and did something else. Um, and obviously now it's closer to 50%. So there's a much bigger pool of very talented people that all of the universities can pull upon um, to bring in. So therefore it's likely to be much more diverse. And the other thing that is also uh, has increased quite significantly are foreign students. So again, when I, when I first arrived, of course there were people who came from other markets other than the UK, but there weren't that many. Um, so again, the competitive set tends to be smaller and within the UK rather than broader and global. So I think that's changed quite a bit as well. No, absolutely. Um, and I think we have some students uh, uh, taking part today and they may want to come back and just uh, quiz you a little bit more about that later. Um, let's turn to the sort of substantive topic of today's uh, discussion, uh, conversation, the role of E&D and your extensive business experience. I should just say to people listening that um, Henrietta and I will interchangeably use terms like E&D, D&I, EDI, and we're talking about the same thing, equality, diversity, and inclusion. We're just um, phrasing it slightly differently. So um, when we talk about diversity and inclusion in the workforce, we often hear great um, uh, 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 sentiments that you know it's the right thing to do it, 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 uh, it we, we have to do it because it's ethically right but what would you say to somebody who said well it might be the right thing to do but it's not necessarily the profitable thing to do um, you know can diversity and inclusion and profitability in a business context go hand in hand I think that's a really good question and a lot of people think it's a dilemma but what I'd like to do, I hope this afternoon is prove to you that it's not, um, because I think that's, uh, that's actually really important. Now, uh, and I'll start actually by um, talking about some um, research that McKinsey, who are a, um, a quite a well-known um, global consultancy firm, um, and they do a lot of data and they're extremely good at it. Um, but those businesses, they have discovered those businesses um, in the survey that they've done in the top quartile of most diverse executive teams, they're 36% more profitable than those businesses in the bottom quarter. Now, those businesses are both ethnically and gender diverse because those are the two criteria they were looking at. Um, but even if you took gender diversity by itself and took out the ethnicity piece, the improvement was, was 25%. Um, and I said only 25% perhaps, but it's pretty good as well. So it does demonstrate that that, um, that level of diversity does improve performance. 
Now, clearly, there's a wide range of, of, of different sort of attributes of diversity. It's not just gender and ethnicity. There are all sorts of, of different sorts that add to the outperformance of a business. So it could be disability, it could be sexual orientation, it might be socioeconomic background, it might be age. And indeed, those sort of intersectionality parts of the different strands are all absolutely critical to make sure that you genuinely have a diverse group of people sitting around a table um, talking about uh, the business and, and issues. And the reason why I say that, it's really interesting to note that it's actually the executive team, not the board, that drives this out to performance compared to peers. So because a diverse board sets the tone and the intent, which is important, but it's the diverse executive where the impact on performance is really driven. And it's really interesting that the Harvard Business Review found that diverse teams can solve problems much faster than teams with cognitively similar people. And Deloitte, who's another um, uh, firm of, um, of consultants, found that when employees think their organization is committed to and supportive of diversity and that they feel included, their ability to innovate increases by 83%. And the latest McKinsey research, which again looks, looks again at gender and, and, um, and ethnicity, um, demonstrates that actually within the UK, if you're able to bridge the gender gap at work, it has the potential to create an extra 150 billion pounds worth of extra GDP and potentially another 840,000 additional female employees. If you apply that to um, race and ethnicity, which Ruby McGregor Smith did in her review, um, it also found that we're missing out on about 24 billion pounds a year from that side of, um, of the business as well by not focusing on the partic participation of ethnically diverse colleagues. So gender and ethnicity combined, if you sort of take that kind of GDP argument, it's about 8% of UK GDP. It's a huge amount. So I think that, you know, to, to the question you asked me, you know, doing the right thing is always right. Of course it is. But actually, there is no compromise here. The right thing, um, both in terms of fairness and equity, absolutely. But it's also the right thing from an economic perspective. And I think that's really important. And I know that I'm talking about profit here, but um, in your own organisations and in the third sector, so in education and the third sector, there are other indicators of success, if you like, that I know, Rebecca, you were wanting to talk a little bit about, that also demonstrate that that is true as well. I think I think uh, it's interesting you you say that because obviously economics of success and metrics of profitability aren't quite um, uh, salient in a in a higher education context, but I think there are um, sort of similar or analogous issues. So the the the, the kinds of debates that will happen, I think. Um, uh, that I'm familiar with are that, that there's somehow a trade-off between excellence and between prioritizing equality and diversity and that these are you know, mutually exclusive and um, can you be at the top of the global league tables? Can you, you know, um, be ahead of your uh, peer competitors uh, in the sector while prioritizing equality and diversity? Um, I, uh, you know, uh, in the Q&A or, or, or later would be very happy to talk a little bit about that perspective from, from, um, from, from my vantage point. But, but it certainly seems from what you're saying that you are arguing that a diverse business case can be more successful. These things are not mutually exclusive. Why do you think that's the case? I think there are a number of factors at play. Um, but one of the most important um, is the fact that, di and it comes actually to your point around excellence as well, it would play into that as well as profitability, where the diversity of thought, diversity of experience and ideas when problem solving, developing plans, debating issues and those sorts of things, um, for the, for, for in, in our case, the business to grow, in your case, it could be a piece of research or it might be a particular paper that you're looking at or something like that. Um, that, that is absolutely critical to um, improve productivity, improve performance. Um, and it's also why the executive team makes such a difference because in business, they're the ones that are actually running the business. They set out the plans, they're making them happen. They set the tone and the culture of the business, those corporate behaviors again. Um, and if you have different views around the table and a culture and a behavior of positive discussion, um, comfortable challenge um, as you start to develop your thinking, you come to much better, more innovative decisions and solutions because you'll see the problem or the opportunity from lots of different perspectives and therefore you're more likely to be able to solve it more effectively or to see or to think about it differently. 
Um, the skeptic in me would say, you know, um, it's got to be more than just problem solving and better decision making. Yep, it? it has, and you're right. <laughs> good, ske good skeptic antennae. Um, and, and actually, it's a multiple of interconnected things um, that all sort of add up to a better and more successful business. Um, and I'll run through a few of them because I think they're all all interesting and, and none of them by themselves are the sort of the, uh, you know, the silver bullet or the killer blow or whatever you want to call it. But all of them contribute in a sort of an ecosystem of things that go well for a business. So, for example, if your senior team are really diverse, then they will understand their many different customers better. So they produce better products. They produce more suitable services. Um, they're going to be developed to meet those needs of those customers. And then in turn, those customers recognize that the business represents their needs much better and they are much more likely to buy from them, therefore. I mean, you know, how many of you on this call have made a decision not to buy from a business because you felt your values weren't aligned with theirs or they haven't really understood you when they were designing their product or their offer? Probably quite a few of them because I certainly know I have. Um, and with social media and a younger generation of, of um, tech native consumers, presumably many of whom are on this call, I would guess, um, increasingly customers vote with their feet or indeed their mouse or their smartphone. And those customers also, interestingly, of course, are your potential employees. So the second issue, which I think is really important to consider is, you know, would you want to work for a business that was not representative of the society we live in today? Um, that it wasn't diverse or that had role models for everyone to aspire to throughout the organization? Because I think, we all want to work for an organization where the leaders making the decisions are like me, whoever me is. Um, so not only will sort of non-diverse businesses lose customers, but they'll also miss out on the best talent who will choose to go elsewhere to work. So for me, you know, you've got the best customers, you've got the best talent, uh, innovative problem solving and decision making. And those start to add up to quite an impact on overperformance possibly getting close to the 30%, 36% McKinsey has measured perhaps. So I hope you agree that the business case is starting to get quite solid. I do agree. I, 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 I uh, you, and it won't be surprising um, that I agree, but, but I think in fact, um, there's now really growing evidence that shows that all the things you're talking about um, in terms of the business case for EDI are, are equally applicable to higher education and, and in fact to all um, professional sectors and Oxford is I think fully aware that if we are to remain at the top of our game um, uh, and to be a leading global institution we have to be recruiting from the, the very best talent pools both for students mm -hmm. and uh, in particular for staff our administrative staff uh, our research staff our faculty etc um, and maintaining business as usual is just too risky in in yeah. today's environment and you know likely uh, that more dynamic and more innovative institutions will will overtake us so we 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 are fully aware that that we need to be um, ensuring that we're getting the talent and and that talent doesn't come in any particular shape size um, color package you know uh, we, we need to um, to to be open to recognizing it uh, uh, in whatever form it comes in but I think also I agree with your point that that um, that it, I hate this term a no-brainer but but I, I think it, it just has to be the case that productivity and innovation are boosted when individuals feel that the environment they're working in is supportive, is collaborative, um, uh, you know, values strong relationships. And it's not hard to understand why that should be the case, you know, that, that um, if you feel valued, if you feel psychologically safe within the institution you are working in, you're just more, much more likely to be more productive, more creative, uh, contribute more. So um, I think that has to be true, whether we're talking about the world of business or whether we're talking about the public sector or the arts or in, in our case, um, the world of higher education. So we're on the same page. Um, but going back to what you said a minute ago, um, you talked about employee choice. Mm. Um, could you just say a little bit more about how diversity and inclusion drives that choice and supports employee satisfaction? 
Yeah, and I think that plays to your part on productivity as well, the, the, the point you made on that. You know, it's very difficult if people are not um, uh, not happy where they are to, for them to perform. Um, and I think the culture and the behaviours of the organisation, if they don't fit with your own values, then you're not going to be satisfied as an employee. And frankly, you'll likely leave that business. I, I left a business because I was uncomfortable, actually, with, fun enough, in, in, in my career. Um, I just sort of... Um, you know, it, it didn't work. I, I really didn't appreciate the culture. It was very misogynistic, for example. Um, and I just I, and I left. And sometimes you have to do that. Um, or in some cases, you won't get the talent to join in the first place. Or, as I say, actually worse is if if you stay, you don't enjoy it. So you don't do a great job. You don't thrive and you don't enjoy what you're doing. And, and the business doesn't get the best out of you. And that's probably the worst possible, <laughs> the worst possible um, outcome. So and I think the important thing to remember as, as a leader of a business is talent votes with its feet and it tends to use them to go to find the best places to work. Um, and I think the current generation of employees, especially those under 35, I think they're really demanding of this. I think in my day, you know, my remember when I left Heinz to go to go to another business, my father was horrified. He thought I was going to stay there for 50 years because that's what you did in his day. Um, but I think that the current generation are even more demanding than perhaps perhaps we were or we were early demanders, let's put it that way. But I think there's also some good sort of uh, research evidence on this as well. So Deloitte has found that 69, so nearly 70% of millennials um, whose leaders or senior management teams are diverse, they feel that their workplaces are more stimulating and more motivating. Um, and we, um, we do an annual um, employment trends and skills survey. Um, and that indicates that 52% of respondents say that shared company-wide values are key employee engagement and I think also when people are deciding to accept positions or not is an interesting one so 54% of women and 45% of men in a PWC survey so that's um, another consultancy firm um, said they um, that they actively researched the company um, to see if it had DNI policies in place when they were deciding to accept a position and a further 61% of women and 48% of men said they actually assessed the diversity of the company's leadership team when deciding to accept an offer or not. Mm -hmm. So, and, and those numbers are going up. Mm -hmm. um, so the reputation of diversity within the company and the evidence that DNI is taken seriously and is a critical driver of choice for the best talent. And as I say, that talent, as we, as we talked about, delivers its best work when they're satisfied and motivated. Yeah, I know. Thank you. Um, we've spoken quite a lot about what we're calling the business case and the case for talent. Um, what other drivers are important in making sure that DNI are at the centre of a good business strategy? Yeah, well, I, I, th I think that's um, uh, there are other things as well, of course. And I think there were three that I pulled out in particular that I thought it was worth sort of talking about. Um, one of them is legislation. Um, you know, governments legislate. Um, uh, so just in case the business hadn't noticed um, that they could be more profitable or they were losing, losing talent, um, legislation is there to help them along the right path. Um, I think the case for fairness and equity within society is a key driver, particularly now. Um, and then I'm afraid back to money again, but investment pounds and dollars count uh, where you get your money from and how much it costs. So if we sort of look at legislation first, um, I mean, the UK was actually the first market to launch mandatory gender pay gap reporting in 2017. So that was quite revolutionary. Um, and all businesses who have over 250 employees have to do it each year. Um, and most UK, but nearly 100 percent of those businesses do do that. And I think it demonstrates that that businesses really do see it as an important part of their success over time. Um, the government also sponsored something called the Hampton Alexander Review, which, along with the 30 percent club, which some of you may have heard of, has driven female participation on boards and into leadership positions. And it's it's frankly, it's it's really successfully changed the face of UK business. Um, there's more to do, but it, it, it has made really, really good progress. And the government uh, today at the moment, it's on their agenda, are looking at mandatory ethnicity pay gap reporting, which I think is great. Uh, why do I think that's great? Because uh, if you have the data, you can do something about it. See my science background coming out again. Um, and, and also that action leads to results. And whilst gender is heading in the right direction um, in business leadership, ethnicity has stalled and it really needs renewed commitment and focus. And one of the things that I've been working on over the summer is we just launched something called Change the Race Ratio Campaign, which is business owned 
uh, and business run initiative to really drive ethnic diversity and leadership in UK business. It's going to be similar to sort of the way the 30% club worked um, from a gender perspective. Um, it's very much about driving action and results in ethnic diversity in business leadership in the UK because peer pressure works. Um, and um, we are in the process of launching that this month, actually, uh, because it's Black History Month, which is great. Um, so that's one thing is, is governments and legislation. And that leads quite nicely onto the question of fairness and participation and also equity in society and in business. Um, and I think the past seven months have brought this topic to the fore and shone a really, really harsh light on race and fairness and the continued impact of, of our history, our shared history on today. Um, and you'll all be aware, I mean, George Floyd's dreadful murder made, I think anyone with any humanity just stop and think about what they really cared about. Um, and empathy is really hard when you haven't walked in the other person's shoes, but I think the world stopped and listened and they wanted to understand and then they reflected on the world we've created. And I think out of that empathy has grown from this moment in time, but really importantly, so is action. And that's the most important thing um, because we can't change the past, um, but we can understand it, we can reflect on it, and we can work hard to make sure that we really learn from it and use those lessons as we face the future. And the other thing in the past seven months that we're all aware of, we're in the middle of it at the moment, is that COVID-19 has also fallen really unevenly and it's highlighted existing equalities in the UK and indeed elsewhere in the world. The health impact has fallen very unevenly on black and ethnic minority communities in the UK, for example, and the economic impact has been particularly tough for women and for working families, women in particular, because they tended to be in part-time employment. And of course, as the children were sent home from school, they've borne the brunt of the childcare. And it also continues to be very tough as job losses bite, uh, businesses struggle to keep afloat through the second wave, and the younger generation who are just entering the workforce are being disproportionately hit by the lack of available work. So we're now in a deep economic crisis. Um, we, I was uh, listening to the um, governor of the Bank of England last night, Andrew Bailey, he was talking to a, to a group of ours. Um, and he was saying that, you know, our economy, he thinks by the end of the year will be round about nine to 10% smaller than it was before the pandemic began. But I think what's quite interesting about that, I mean, which is, is gonna take some clawing back, but in previous economic downturns, diversity and inclusion efforts generally stalled in business, people put them on the back burner. But it's really interesting and encouraging to see from some of the surveys that we've been doing over the pandemic that DNI has either maintained or increased importance on business agendas during the time. Because just over 60% of businesses have actually maintained its importance and just under 40% have actually increased it. Um, and it's also, I think, interesting to note. So that, that focus on um, on people's wellness, mental health, their livelihoods, all of those sorts of things have really come to fore. It's been a health crisis. It has become an economic crisis. But I think businesses have continued that focus on the health and well-being of their employees, which has been really important to see. The other thing I think it's also interesting to note is that during economic downturns, the number of startups tend to increase. And there are two reasons for that. One is that government incentives um, uh, tend to they tend to incentivize new businesses because they want to drive economic growth. So they put incentives on the table, that's helpful. But also increasingly, entrepreneurs also decide to take the plunge because labor markets become restricted. So they go, you know, I've applied for 200 jobs, nobody bothered to answer, I'm gonna start my own business. And many of those startups from previous downturns end up being really, really successful businesses. And I think the class of 2007, eight gave us businesses such as Brewdog, Not On The High Street and Zoopla. So there are upsides um, to, to this downturn. Some people are actually doing relatively well. And some of the businesses we talk to are having their best year ever. So retailers who've managed to go online are doing incredibly well. Staycations, they've taken off. Glamping, Airbnb, boutique hotels, they're fully booked for months in advance. And fresh food providers who used to supply to restaurants, which are now closed or who um, have very low levels of demand, for example, have actually set up online to sell less fair produce direct to customers. And they're actually doing really, really well. 
And one, the one I love, which I think is just brilliant, it's so innovative, it was a wedding organiser, only a wedding organiser could do this. Um, they, they were trying to get around the only six, six people rule or only 20 people at a wedding or whatever. So they arranged a drive-in wedding, like a drive-in cinema, um, where everyone was in the car. So each family was self-contained. Um, they, uh, they had people on sort of roller skates that went around serving sort of food through, through the doors and you could sort of um, order it up on your, um, on your sort of um, iPad and, and you, you were brought, I don't know, presumably champagne, I guess, and, and food. Um, and then the ceremony was on the stage and on a big screen. And then at the end of it, the bride and groom got in a golf cart and went up and down the roads of the of the, uh, of the various parked cars, waving and sort of saying hello to everybody. It's absolutely brilliant. Loved it. It was great. Mm -hmm. So innovation is is uh, is definitely um, at the forefront when when times become hard. And I think out of adversity um, comes opportunity. And as I said, innovation. And I think especially with technology providing access to consumers, access to markets, it's faster, it's done more cheaply, it's easier to do. Um, and I think that you know, action as a result of all of this happening with, and looking at those sort of three areas, reflection, responsibility, um, and I think innovation and understanding, I think they're all coming together in business and society to drive those changes that are needed. Um, and I think everybody is focused on looking to build back, we've talked about build back better, but I think it's building back more fairly and interestingly, more sustainably and greener from what has been frankly a pretty terrible 2020 for, for most businesses and, and indeed for individuals as well. I'd love to talk more about uh, roller skating weddings, Henrietta, but uh, keeping, keeping uh, focused on the topic at hand. You actually mentioned two, you said you were going to talk about three kind of levers. You've talked about legislation, um, you talked about values and sort of ethical norms. What, what's, mm -hmm. what's the third lever in driving business change? Yeah, I know. So the, the, the one that's actually also quite important to sort of complete the picture is, um, is access to capital. So that's money. Um, so businesses need money to operate and to develop and to export and to grow their businesses and to do all the things they need to do in order to be successful. Um, and financial institutions um, such as, for example, um, investment companies like Franklin Templeton, uh, pension funds, um, insurance companies and banks hold that money that is then invested into those businesses. Now, the money belongs to customers, so it belongs to you and me. Um, and all of those customers want a financial return on that money because they want to use it to pay for things like uh, retirement, for example, or they might want to use it to pay for a house, or perhaps they're saving up for their children's university fees or something like that. But that's why, you know, that's why banks ask for money and, you know, they, they need a return on the money because the money is owned by their customers who want a return. Um, but also, I think increasingly, customers like you and I um, want to know that their money is being used to support businesses that care about things like fairness, that care about things like the environment and whose purpose they believe in. Um, businesses who care about what we in business call ESG, so environment, social and governance. So they care about the in, um, environment. They are socially aware and have good social practices and good, a good culture and purpose and they are governed well um, as an organization. But helpfully, which is really good news, as we've talked about um, earlier in this conversation, financial return and ESG are quite well aligned. So we've already proved that more diverse businesses are more profitable, and so a better financial return over time for your investment, but also those businesses tend to have a much stronger social purpose as well, and both environment as well as DNI are embedded quite well in their business strategies. So those financial institutions with your money to invest are increasingly building ESG considerations into the cost of that money they're prepared to lend to businesses. So if your leadership isn't diverse, if your team is not diverse, your cost of funding will be more expensive. And these investors are increasingly committed to voting against board appointments at AGMs, which I think is really interesting as well, because they have start, started doing that. And I think it was... Um, Elgin, who's a big, um, uh, a big pension fund business, have said that next year, I think they're going to start um, voting on, on this and a lot of other um, investment companies have started to line up behind that. So I think it's going to be a really interesting dynamic to watch because they will effectively force businesses to make these changes, those that aren't already making them. Many of them are making them, lots of them are making them, but it, it, it's another forcing mechanism. Yeah. I want to go on to um, talk a little bit about 
how from the why to the how but it, I just interject by saying it's it's fascinating to hear you present the 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 rationale and the justification for driving EDI in this sort of three-pronged way and it is fascinating to me that it is almost um, identical to how I would make the same arguments to the constituencies that I might try to to make that justification to I'm very glad to say that when I when I first began in my role in 2015 um, I would always begin with with that that sort of presentation six years on I don't need to anymore actually I don't need to put up my little diagram of the triangle which talks about regulatory legislative kind of you know requirements the business case the moral ethical case and um uh, uh spell it out in, in in the way that you're you're doing now i think we we've, we've moved from having to to justify it to saying okay we understand it we get it how do we do it um yeah. uh so i'd like in a way if we haven't got very much longer keeping an eye on um right. on time and uh, it would be nice to just bring a few questions in if we can but maybe we could just end a little bit henrietta with moving from the why do this to the mm -hmm. how what are the strategies what are the mechanisms to drive change what what are leaders because obviously that you've been part of leadership of organizations what do you have to do to do that? Yeah, and I think that's a, a really valid point. Uh, the only thing I will say is that you're quite well advanced on your journey, I suspect, and businesses are on a spectrum. Some of them are just starting where they're still having to justify for themselves and their, their boards why this is important and needed. And others are well on the journey where they have got fantastic results already um, because they've been doing this for a number of years and they've already got um, senior people into positions that are where they're incredibly diverse. So it is a huge uh, spectrum of, of um, capability. Um, but I, I'm, I think when you talk about what you do, I think the most important thing to think about is um, working out what problem you're trying to fix. And that may sound a really obvious thing to do, but it's actually where data comes in. Um, and actually, you need to work out um, where you are and what, where you're trying to get to um, on, on diversity. You need to look at the and you need to look at the data in a sufficiently granular way to make sure you're solving the right problem. Because if you solve if you solve the sort of the, the average, if you like, you won't solve you won't get sufficiently granular to be able to actually solve the issues. You've got to do a sort of an issue breakdown analysis. And so you get into areas where they're small enough to go, OK, I actually understand what I'm looking at here and I actually know how to do something about this. I can get my arms around it and make a difference. If you do that at a, at a sufficiently granular level, those then sort of roll up into fixing the overall issue, which is we don't seem to have many people with, say, um, an ethnic background or, say, a diverse background of some sort in our senior leadership or through our organisation. So I'll give you an example from my own business quickly. Um, and it, it's quite a good one, actually. So we were looking at ethnicity and how we, we were pretty good on gender and how we might set some targets and a plan. But what we discovered that having an average one, so let's call it, you know, 20 percent, whatever that is, it really, really wasn't helpful because at the lower levels of the organization, we were actually really diverse. So we clearly didn't have a recruitment issue. And had we set 20 percent, everybody would have given up because we were already at 25 percent. So there was clearly no problem. But actually, if you think of a pyramid in terms of how people move up from an organization, the bottom tier, in order to get to a reasonable level at the top tier, probably needed to be over 30 percent. So actually, there was some work to do, but we didn't have a recruitment issue. But what we did have was a progression up the organization issue, which was really slow. So we have put in place things like mentoring, which is important. Sponsorship, even more important. Key difference is that if you're being mentored, you're having a conversation with somebody and you're in the room, you're being sponsored, the senior person is round the table where they're looking at which project you might want to work on. They're going, I've got a really great idea. This person will be terrific on that project or with you know, looking after that client or whatever it is. You actually sponsor that person into the sort of the high performing business strands, if you like, and that then enables them to progress faster through the organization. And then things like specific skills development. One of the things that was really important actually was um, a number of our colleagues who came from um, uh, slightly more diverse backgrounds sometimes struggled when they were being interviewed internally for a promotion. So what we did is the executive team, people like myself, actually gave them interview practice beforehand. Um, so that when they went in, they actually sort of, because they've never, many of them had never had those sorts of conversations before. So we actually helped them with that. Um, and that made quite a material difference to those that actually then ended up getting promoted. So that's um, a really good example of being specific. 
I won't go into the other one, but as I say, at more senior levels, just to say it was the reverse. We had a recruitment issue that needed to be addressed and, um, and we had to look quite hard at how we set about recruiting people, where they were from, what their backgrounds were and all of those sorts of things. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. We could go on and on, I, I'm sure. Um, uh, and I hope we'll have the opportunity to continue the conversation uh, 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 offline, Henrietta, also. But I think Kerry, just out of um, sort of uh, conscientious timekeeping and giving our audience an opportunity to ask a few questions, should we do that now? Yes, I think, I think that we're, we're at a sort of natural pause, if that's all right. Yes, so just to encourage you, if you have got any questions for Henrietta or Rebecca, then please do put them onto the chat function for us. Um, I've got one here that was sent in um, ahead of the, um, of the talk this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to read it literally as it's sent in. So I'm not going to um, attempt to um, change it at all. It says, isn't this emphasis on gender and race equality, in fact, engendering its own form of racial discrimination? I know people will say, I'm, that's the question poser, a racist and sexist for posing this question, but I accept women in all professions, pilots, surgeons, county councillors, or dustmen. I accept that I may be defended by a black barrister or may have my plumbing sorted by a black plumber. To me, they're just pilot, plumbers, and surgeons. Mm. Interesting one. Um, yeah, um, we quite often get people talking about that. Um, and I think, you know, it is it is a fair challenge um, with all of these things. What you're looking for is the best candidate. Um, and um, for many hundreds of years, the best candidate has typically been a white bloke. Um, and I can't believe that's true when actually they make up probably about 40 percent of the population. So if you take women as about 52 percent of the population, you then take the ethnicity group of men out of the male population, um, it's about 40 something percent of the population. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting thing to reflect on. Um, but what you're looking for is meritocracy. You're looking to give people equal opportunities. And actually the thing I've learned when I've been looking into this a little bit more is that providing the same opportunity is not the same as providing equity. Um, and a very good example is that if you are a very tall person and if you're a very short person and you're watching a football match, you're both given an opportunity of looking over the fence, for example, at a football match. The tall person can see, the short person can't, because the short person needs something to step up on. That's equity. Equality is both of them standing on the ground trying to look over the fence, because then everybody arrives at the opportunity with different skills and different attributes. And sometimes they need a bit of help in order to be able to achieve the, the, uh, the same opportunity as the person next door to them, depending on what they're bringing to the party. So um, I, I do understand that. Um, you know, I've got, I've got two sons, um, I've got two daughters as well, but this isn't about preferring one over the other. It's about having a genuinely diverse workforce based on, um, on skill, based on meritocracy, where everybody has the same opportunities to be able to perform. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, we've got another one here. Um, Again, I'm reading it as it's come in, and because these are anonymized questions, we can't go back and clarify with people, just to be clear. How should we avoid too much politicized or diversity and inclusivity as it should be treated naturally? Well, if you, don't, if you don't have a plan, nothing happens. I don't think it needs to be politicized, but it does need to be, I, I hope I've demonstrated, embedded in your core business strategy. Because if it isn't, then your business strategy may not be very successful. Either you'll be less productive, you won't, you won't um, get the best candidates to come along and work for your business, and you may not have the best products and services for your customers as well. So um, I don't think it's about being political, I think it's about being effective. Unless you've got a plan, you know, it's not going to happen. So you need, a, you need a, great, a great strategy, a great plan, and, and to make it happen. It doesn't be anything political, it just needs, it's just good business sense. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. And then the final one we've got that came in early was many people focus on how line, manage line managers ensure diversity. How would you recommend a leader embed diversity in the organisation or team culture? Um, culture comes from the top. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, but there are lots of um, lots of ways of looking at your own um, own area within the business. So I was I was uh, working with a board um, who had a number of different divisions. Um, and the, it goes back to the, the granularity of the data and, the, and there were different issues in different parts of the business. So in their commercial team, it was different from their manufacturing team, which was different from their R&D team. 
So the most important thing is, is don't do things by averages. If you're a manager in a line role, work out what your own situation looks like and where you can help. So in other words, you know, when you've got a new um, appointment coming up or a new role, for example, you know, who are the people who are applying for it? Um, you know, have you got a diverse um, shortlist, for example? Um, how are you interviewing them? One of the absolutely critical things is um, if the people interviewing you um, are not like you, people are much less likely to want to come and work for you. So we had some feedback actually in a previous role that I had, a previous job, where they said, you know, great company, we love it. But every time we come, you know, all of the people sort of look like this and I look like that. So um, it's not a very diverse interview panel. Um, and we, ha we honestly hadn't thought about it. Um, so some of these things are really quite simple, but you just have to take a step back and think quite hard about it. What's putting people off or encouraging people? I just had one come in online. It says, are you aware of studies looking at the impact of culture and backgrounds on diversity and inclusivity in different parts of the world? For example, Southern Europe versus Northern Europe. We've done some work on that, yeah. Um, and um, it does vary. And you'll, I mean, gender is slightly more straightforward. When you start getting into things like um, ethnicity, it does very much depend on um, the nature of, uh, of the market that you're in or the country that you're in. And... Um, different diversity so for example um i uh, you know if you were looking at diversity in a german company for example um then you would expect to see quite a number of um, turkish colleagues uh if you were looking at diversity in a in a french company for example you look at quite a lot of um, asian colleagues but also quite a lot of people from north africa so again it very much depends on which market you're in um, and it, it does vary quite significant so does data. So in France, for example, it is illegal to hold data on ethnicity for colleagues in a business, um, whereas obviously it's not in the UK, it's voluntary. So again, it varies hugely across the different markets. Well, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. Um, we've had an hour's worth of chat, the most fascinating discussion between Rebecca and Henrietta, and I hope that everyone has found it hugely informative. I certainly have enjoyed it very much. I'd like to thank Henrietta and Rebecca most warmly for giving up their time this afternoon. It really has been a fascinating and enlightening discussion. Um, this is just a reminder that the, this is the second lecture of a series of six, and the next one takes place next Tuesday, October the 27th, and there will be a registration link being circulated shortly. So that's it for this week. So thank you very much again to Henrietta and to Rebecca, and goodbye from a very sunny Oxford, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Henrietta. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.